Two weeks after I was born, the Chernobyl nuclear reactor exploded. I was actually one of the babies that suffered from the big pollution that happened. I had a respiratory arrest as a baby, so I just stopped breathing. So it's considered being clinically dead. Definitely growing up with knowing you got a second chance in life, uh, it definitely makes you want to do something good with it. Unfortunately, I didn't always have the opportunity. Like, I was born in a very small city in Ukraine. You don't have an amazing business community or startup community there. And uh, when I was young, we immigrated to Israel. But also, again, we immigrated to an itty bitty town called Akko. It's in the north of Israel. We didn't even have a cinema in the city. Being from a small town, you definitely don't get like an everyday opportunity to do something big. So I wanted to do, but I didn't really get the chance. I went to work as an English Hebrew translator in a, in a renewable energy company. And that's how I discovered that, uh, wow, renewable energy is really a great method of changing the world, especially in line with my personal experience. Plus, I saw that wind energy and solar energy is fully commercialized. And in 2011, when I started my company, Wave Energy, everybody said it's a huge resource. Uh, Wave Energy can produce twice the amount of electricity that the world produces now but uh, there were, weren't any commercial scale uh, wave energy implemented. Like everybody are talking about fighting climate change and mitigating pollution and investing in re renewable energy. But really like the world investment in renewable energy is very low right now. It's, the average is 1% of the country's GDP globally. It's nothing, like it's a very small percentage. You know, being young, naive and very ambitious uh, all together, I said to myself, okay, all these big companies that have billions of dollars, they cannot make wave energy. I can, with no money, no connection, no technical background. I was 24 years old when I started the company, which is super young, especially in the energy industry. I researched a lot of the reason why other wave energy developers failed. That was the first step that I did, because uh, I understood that if you want to commercialize wave energy, it definitely has to find solutions for the prevailing problems in the field. Uh, how I started the company is basically, I went to a social event and I met uh, my partner there. His name is David Leb, he's a serial entrepreneur. Uh, I went to Ukraine, to the same city where I was born, and I made a competition between 300 engineers and chose a team of five that actually developed uh, our idea into practical sketches, blueprints and so on. And that's actually how the company, you know, started. So basically the system is very simple. It has a simple hardware, but very smart software that controls it. So we attach a unique floater shapes to existing structures like piers, breakwaters and other types of uh, ocean structures, which are man-made. The floaters are going up and down with the movement of the waves. They're pushing a hydro cylinder, which transmit biodegradable oil into land-located accumulators. A pressure is being built in the accumulators, which is equivalent to the height of the waves. So higher the waves, higher pressure. And this pressure is used to turn the hydro motor that is turning the generator, which is transmitting clean electricity into the grid. So right now we have two installations. We have an installation in the port of Jaffa for uh, running for four years. It was mainly used as a, you know, a proof of concept and a place where we can demonstrate the workability of the technology because it was very new and people weren't sure that it even works. And it also serves as, a, as an R&D site where we make uh, new inventions about the floater shapes and about the automation system and so on. Uh, the second station that we have is in Gibraltar. It is currently the only grid-connected wave energy array that is operating uh, upon a commercial power purchase agreement in the world. And we have a PPA with the government to expand it to 5 megawatt, which is 15% uh, of all Gibraltar's electricity need. Listen, it would be definitely a historical project because, uh, again, wave energy till now was mostly R&D. And once the first commercial project will be built, it will be the beginning of the expansion of wave energy internationally. And we have a project pipeline with projects in Mexico, in China, in the UK, in uh, different locations around the world. There is definitely advantage to wave energy over certain resources. For example, uh, solar energy is an amazing source, but you can get solar energy uh, only when it's sunny. Uh, wind energy is also an amazing resource, but it's mostly dominate early in the morning or late at night, when the population actually uses the energy the least, so the timing is a bit of a problem. Wave energy in many countries can be produced around the clock, so there's definitely an advantage. I think the solution is combination of 
everything. So when we have the sun, we make solar power, and when we have wind, we make wind power, and when we have waves, we get wave energy, and all of these sources combined, they can really produce more than 100% of what the world needs at the moment. Breaking down, it was a real concern of the wave energy industry and of the investors even in my company. They said, okay, what are you going to do when there is a storm? So I think one of the advantages of our technology is that we don't install in the offshore, we don't install in the middle of the sea. We install on existing breakwaters and piers and other type of uh, man-made structures. And the second advantage is that we have a patented storm protection mechanism. So basically when the waves are too high for the system to handle, we lift the floaters above the water level, like they kind of become a part of the breakwater and it stays locked until the storm passes. And when the storm passes, it automatically commences operation and goes back into the water. Plus we have insurance, which is an important uh, point. Every time I went to conferences, everybody thought that I'm somebody's secretary. Like every time I would walk in a boardroom, people would say espresso, please. Being an, an entrepreneur, no matter of the you know, male or female, is hard. Being a female entrepreneur, as I don't know, it at least twice as hard, you know? Because especially when you're going into male-dominated industries like energy, it's mostly men and older men also. And I'm a young and I'm a woman, so I don't fit. You know, if a woman is in the boardroom, she's probably coming to bring me coffee. Which is, it's not an easy way, you know? Because uh, you're already, when you're coming to pitch your idea or you're coming to an investor, you're already concerned, like, how I'm gonna present it, how I'm gonna explain the financials, how I'm gonna explain the engineering aspect. Here you have to also worry on an additional layer, like how am I gonna be perceived as a woman? Uh, he just asked me for coffee though, so is there a chance that he will take me seriously by the end of the meeting? Can I prove myself? And the best way forward is fixing it, you know, fixing the laws to create equality, forcing every company to have at least 50% of females in its board to make sure that at least 50% of the speakers are female entrepreneurs. Because many times I find myself speaking in conferences or in panels when I'm the only woman, or I'm the only woman in the room, forget speaking. When you go into the energy industry, about 2% or 1% of the room like, is women, so that's a problem. Plus, I think it's very important that other female entrepreneurs, women that already made it, that are already successful or on the way to success, to mentor the young generation. So to provide our experience, to support when needed. Male entrepreneurs, for example, they're very good at it because they always pull somebody up with them. You know what I mean? Like when you're working in a big company, so usually the man on the top of the pyramid is saying, okay, I want this guy to see him promoted. They go out, they have drinks together after work and they kind of help each other. And women need to do the same thing. We need to pull out other women, support other women, help other women, mentor other women. We're very good for everything. We're good for army, we're good for paying our taxes. We're good for everything that the country needs from us. There are very dominant Israeli female entrepreneurs, but there is a bit of, let's call it, non-equality for female entrepreneurs. I give a recent example. The councillor of Germany, Angela Merkel, came to visit Israel. And she asked from the government to introduce her to the startup scene in Israel. She wanted to meet the entrepreneurs. And uh, they made like a very nice event in the Tel Aviv Museum and they invited 50 entrepreneurs, all men. She was the only woman in the room and she looked at Benjamin Netanyahu, our prime minister, and she said to him like, well, I guess the startup community in Israel is not advanced enough to include women. You know, she actually said something about, it. and I always say it's amazing that it leaks because it shows, it points to a real problem. This is what happens when the cameras are off or when there is no press in the room or when nobody is checking, this is what happens. You end up with a room full of men. There's a lot of things to do, but listen, it took us, I don't know, a few thousands of years to get uh, voting rights. It will take a few thousands of years to probably create equality. I hope that it will take less because we already see a very positive change and a very positive movement, especially in Western countries, toward uh, you know, equality. In East Europe, the situation is not that good. I know myself because I visited both uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia and Romania, and I see that not always women get you know, equal chances here, and that really the society is programmed in a certain way, but it can change, anything can change, because when I visited Romania four years ago, I never heard the word, word startup on the street, I didn't have hear innovation, I didn't hear about incubators, I didn't hear almost anything related to entrepreneurship and the startup world. And this time when I came, like since yesterday, everybody are talking about it. I see it's everywhere. So look, a lot have changed in four years. So if so much could change about uh, 
you know, openness to innovation and entrepreneurship, we can have the same change also in female entrepreneurship. But we as female have the responsibility to make sure that it's kept on the agenda, that we're focusing on promoting female entrepreneurship and not other subjects. I started my life by dying, basically. It was really like a constant drive. Like I said, okay, I'm a woman, I'm younger, I don't have the money, I'm from a small town originally, I had these severe health problems, I'm gonna take all 